Welcome back to this new episode of the FuShot Learning series. This episode, I'm going to introduce transfer learning. We are going to see how transfer learning can be applied to the FuShot Learning setting. If you remember from the last episode, we saw that transfer learning consists in taking the image X, given as input, then embedding it inside the latent space to a certain amount of convolutional layers. This can be a standard neural network like a residual network or um, even a multilayer perception if you prefer. The important thing is that at the end you're gonna get a latent vector Z. Now after the latent vector Z we get a tiny amount of output units Y and this are results y1 up to yc and here in the middle we just have a connection for each unit in z right so each unit in z has a different connection to all the unit that are here in the y vector the output vector and this one this series of connection is can embedded inside a matrix W. Now, if Z is in R, D for instance, and Y is in, in this case, R, C, then our matrix W, this will be in just R, D times C, right? So the trick in transfer learning is to train the entire network that we can divide in two stages, the first stage here and the second stage here represented by the matrix W. We have to train these two stages all at once on a training data set at the beginning. And then at test time, we have to fine tune just the last layer on a new set of classes that we are getting as input, okay? Now, how we can do that? How can we train this model uh, using the transfer learning the approach on the standard fusion learning setup? So on the standard fusion learning setup, if you remember well, you have a certain amount of tasks, so task one up to task two, and each one of these tasks has a certain amount of classes. So in this case, three, and we have just one sample per class. So we are in the three-way one-shot case. If you don't remember this terminology, you're invited to give a look again to the first video of the series where I introduced the terminology of using fusion learning. Now, if you give a look again at each one of these tasks at training time, you will notice that in the query set, that is the set that we want to solve, this is a sort of small test set or validation set, we notice that actually at training time we have access to the class labels for each samples in the query set. So since this happens for all the tasks in our training set, what we can say is it just, okay, well, we can just aggregate each one of these classes inside the same container. Okay, so we can take each one of these classes can bring them inside the same container and since we know that this image belongs to this image to this class and also this image belongs to the same class since they have a specific label associated we can just transform this in a standard data set it's just the data set used in supervised learning if you think about that each one of the series of images will have a specific class like class one for dogs class two for planes and you can assign a specific class ID to each one of the classes in your tasks, okay? Basically aggregating all these tasks inside the same data set. So while before you get a task one sampled from a probability distribution over tasks, we now have just a data set D with a certain amount of uh, input and labels okay 
So if we add n images, for instance, right, and it goes from 1 to n, this will be just a set of input labels that you can use for a standard supervised uh, training. Okay, but something different here is happening at testing time. So when you are taking the same approach at testing time, and you are going to analyze each one of the tasks that you have, you will notice that the query set, now you don't have any more the label associated to each ob object in the query set. You still have the classes for the support set. So the support set still has some associated classes, some associated labels, but the query set is unknown. So we have now to find to which class each image in the query set belongs to. And but also in this case, we can give a slightly different interpretation of this problem. What you can say is just, okay, for each task, I still know to which uh, class each image in the support set belongs to. So I can take all the images in the support sets for each task and once again, I can move them inside the same container. And this will be will be a standard data set for supervised learning. And on top of this, I can train again, fine tune my uh, small neural network. So I can fine tune W on this data set here, this labeled. And then once I fine tune W on this labeled data set, now I'm gonna test it on this one that is made by aggregating all the images in my query set. Okay, so now I don't know the label of each one of these images I will aggregate inside the same container. And once I train, fine tune the network, the matrix W, I'm gonna test it on this set of classes. So we saw that the baseline approach described in this paper here was an example of transfer learning fit into a device example. And this is basically what we already saw in the very first slide of this episode. You have a future structure, you have your input, future structure, and then you have a classifier as output. It's a training time. While at test time, you keep fix the parameters inside future structure. You are just going to focus on the matrix W we are going to fine tune this matrix on the new set of data that you got. Now it's interesting to see what's inside this, this box inside the classifier. So the standard baseline here, the standard baseline model, we're going to open this box, this box. You'll see that this is just standard linear layer. You have a matrix W in R D times C. You have an output Y and you have a softmax function. And basically once you pass through your first stage of your network, your future structure, the input, you will get a Latin vector. Let's call it Z. So at the output here, you will get Z, I. And then you have a linear mat uh, layer with a matrix W. So remember that Z here is in Z I, this belongs to R, D, right? And the matrix W just composed of a bunch of vectors W1 up to WC. And each one of these vectors actually belongs to the same space of Z. So if you take W1 you will see that W1 also belongs to RT. And there are C of this vector, one of, of one vector for each class. You, each one of these vectors has the same dimensionality of Z. Now, if you consider the problem from this point of view, you realize that what we are doing in the baseline is just to multiply uh, Z. You have a dot product between Z and each vector in W, and the result is a scalar, is, is quashed through a softmax inside a categorical distribution. So what we get here is just a standard categorical distribution where you have a set of columns for each class, right, up to 
the column for the class 1 up to the class C. So for each class you will have a specific column and the sum of this column is 1 since it's a proper probability distribution, a categorical distribution. And so if we interpret the problem from this point of view, if we consider W like a matrix of vectors like this one, and you have one vector for each class, we can give a slightly different dif interpretation of baseline. And this has been called in the same article, has been called baseline plus plus. And so baseline plus plus, if we are going to open again now this box, I'll give a look to the classifier here for baseline plus plus, you will notice that there is something slightly different going on. And this is much better than baseline in many conditions. And it can give you also pretty good results, very easy to implement also in this case. So we still have this matrix, as you can see, uh, W here is a matrix of vectors. And each one of these vectors, as we said, this belongs to just RD. And we have C of these W vectors inside W, the matrix W. Now let's try to think in these terms. Let's suppose that we have a, a Cartesian plane and that we have a, a unit circle inside this Cartesian plane. Now, if you, if you think in these terms, what we have here? Well, as I told you before, just have a vector z. So we have a vector z here after the first stage of the network with z i, and then we have a certain amount of vectors here. So we have z i, and suppose that we are considering just the very first vector, w1. Now, if we do this, if we normalize this vector, just dividing by the norm of the vector itself, if we repeat this process for both of them, we're taking the norm of this vector and then we're multiplying them, what you will get is a similarity measure between the two vectors, z, i, and w1. What does it mean a similarity measure? What we are doing basically when we normalize these two, these two vectors, and let's suppose that we are indicating with yellow zi and with purple w1. So zi in this case will be, once normalized, it will be squashed inside a unit circle. Let's suppose this is very close to zero on the x-axis while our w1, maybe let's put this around here, this is w1, this is z high, and so the output of this similarity measure between z i and w1 is a scalar, and this scalar actually is in between minus 1 and 1. Why is that? Well, when w1 and z at zi are very similar, so they are very close to each other, we will be very close here to 1. When they are orthogonal, they will be close to 0. And when w1 will be on the other side of the circle, we will, we will have a scalar that is close to minus 1. And since we are going from 1, when the two vectors are very close to each other, passing through 0, going to minus 1, this is effectively a sort of similarity measure. It's very effective in, in our case, because it can give us a, a, a score that identifies how far is zi from each one of these vectors. So what you can do is just say, OK, I can compare for each vector here, w1 up to wc, I can estimate the similarity measure, same between zi and w1, and the similarity measure between zi and wc, 
And as I told you, this is a scalar. So this scalar here, for each one of these vectors, correspond to C total scalars. And C are also the total amount of classes that we have. So what we are doing is just to compare Z to each one of these vectors that can be interpreted as a sort of prototypes. So if you are in a, for instance, three-way, five-shot scenario, you can repeat this process for each one of the samples that you have for each class. You can get a different embedding, you can compare it with WI. You can embed in this WI a sort of prototypical representation of the class, such that this WI will lie in a Latin space, so a sort of mean of all the samples in that class. And now, once you are going to apply this similarity measure, you will see to which one of these prototypes ZI is more close to. And then you can apply, for instance, a softmax function, and you can squash again this inside a categorical distribution. For each class, you will get a, a column that represents just how likely is ZI to belong to that particular class. It's a very simple method, very intuitive, very easy to implement, very efficient, extremely efficient, very easy to train. So you might wonder why then I should, I should not just use transfer learning, for instance, this baseline plus plus that is pretty good. Why cannot, cannot I just do that? Well, if you're going to see some pros and cons of these approaches, you will see that uh, the positive things of this kind of approaches in transfer learning is that they are very easy to implement, to, to train. Also see that it's possible to reuse very large networks. So for instance, we can skip completing the training stage. We just can trick, take a, a network that has been provided by Facebook or Google and just fine tune the very last layer on our, on our uh, testing tasks. It's possible to do with this approach. Another thing that you may notice is that it's very easy to parallelize and split on multiple GPUs since you are just uh, you just have a, a standard data set that you can allocate on multiple GPUs quite easily. Then, as a last uh, as a last advantage, you will see that this is just standard supervised learning, so you can apply all the tips and tricks in supervised learning in this in this setting. So why do we don't use this? What's the problem here? Well, there's a clear problem of underfitting and overfitting since you are doing uh, supervised learning again when you're doing fine tuning. You have to understand when, when you have to stop, how many epochs, and so you have to define a schedule. Now the problem is that this schedule, if it's not perfect, so we are in the middle of underfitting and overfitting, we decide a specific amount of epochs, an optimizer, and so on. But if, if we are going to go in a different domain, so if, if the tasks that we get at test time are quite different from the uh, tasks that we got at training time, and our schedule has been defined at training time on the specific tasks, now we have a problem because our schedule can, can break completely and we, we can get very bad results here. Another problem is that uh, it's not always possible to aggregate a data set. So if you want to aggregate a data set like we did, and like I explained you in the very first uh, two slides, uh, it's not possible to do it always. For instance, if you're in an online setting, you're doing some kind of exploration through a robot of different rooms in an environment, well, you can have a problem because your da data is arriving in a stream and uh, this stream as a specific amount of tasks that may be different from each other. And it's not possible, since the stream is continuous in an online setting, it's not possible to aggregate your data set in this uh, specific problem. And therefore, transfer learning cannot be easily applied in this setting. All right, so in this episode, we saw how transfer learning can be used in few short learning. It's a quite uh, very simple approach to use very effective, can give very good results. We will see some benchmark later on. And uh, this can be a really good starting point uh, if you want to, to start doing something in few short learning. It's very easy to implement. So, that's it for today. Thank you for watching.